Well, please mute their microphones unless they are invited to speak. Uh, I will announce by name and invite to speak those participants wishing to make representations to the committee members in the order of the business uh, to be conducted. Uh, we'll have a short break at 8 p.m. if we haven't finished. Um, now, the Governance and Audit Committee really is the conscience of the Council. Uh, we ensure that everything that we do is done in an open and honest, efficient and transparent manner. Our primary functions uh, are to review the accounts and audit, approving the council's statement of accounts and the council's financial accounts, and review the council's external auditors' reports. On governance, we look at the annual review of the of governance within the council, including the effectiveness of the systems of internal audit and approve the signing of the annual governance statement. Other regulatory matters include matters to do with elections and bylaws. And occasionally we have to look at the standards in relation to members' conduct uh, to consider reports from the monitoring officer on the effectiveness of the members' code of conduct and to advise the council on the adoption or revision of the code. Uh, also, we receive referrals from the monitor's office, monitoring officer uh, into allegations of misconduct and determine any complaints um, that have been made. So we have a, a fairly wide set of activities within the general definition of governance and overview. Um, can I ask the members of the committee to introduce themselves um, in turn, uh, starting with Councillor Burrows and working round. Hello, good evening, everybody. My name's Councillor Michelle Burrows, and I'm the local borough councillor for Withenhoe Ward. Uh, good evening, everybody. Uh, David King, uh, the member for Mile End. Good evening, Councillor Chris Hayter, St Anne's and St John's Ward. Uh, Gerald Oxford, Highwoods Ward. Good evening, Councillor Adam Fox, representing Old Heath, the Hythe and Rowhedge. Good evening, Councillor Stephanie Nissen, representing the Green Party of Castle Ward. Good evening, Councillor Martin Lederdale, um, Lexington and Braiswick Ward, standing in for Lee Tate. Uh, pretty cable. Good evening, Councillor Kevin Bentley, Mark's Town Lair Ward. Uh, thank you. Um, on the matter of substitutions, we have one substitution this evening uh, where Councillor Leatherdale uh, is officiating in place of Councillor Tate. Uh, three urgent items. Uh, I've not been advised of any urgent items, and uh, none have come in since we, um, we reviewed the matter. Uh, item four, declarations of interest. Does any member have a declaration of interest? Item five, have your say. Have any members of the public attended? Don't see any. So we assume that there are no members of the public. Minutes of the previous meeting, 23rd of March, 2021. Uh, can I ask for your agreement that they are a correct record? That takes us on to the first proper item on the agenda, item seven, uh, audit of the 2019-20 accounts, which you'll find on page 17 of the, uh, the electronic version. 
uh, and I believe Mark Jarvis, the finance manager, uh, will be presenting the matter to us. Uh, the action required by the committee is to note the council's draft statement of accounts. Mark. Thank you, Chair. So the report in front of you presents the council's state of accounts for 2021 financial year. For those that are not in attendance at the last committee, or just a reminder for those that were, the council had until the 31st of July to publish a set of draft accounts and had have until the 30th of September to have a final audited set of accounts. So I'm glad to say today we are presenting the 2021 accounts and it's been signed by section 151 on the 11th of June. Um, there's two reasons why we have done this early. The first reason is we have conversations via external auditors. It is felt that we're in such a good position and have had a previous track record of quality draft set of accounts that we can do this by this deadline. Secondly is, in order to facilitate a final set of accounts by the 30th of June, we need to um, have a draft set of accounts as early as possible to facilitate the audit, which is due to start on the 12th of July. For those that have seen the accounts last year, there's been a number of changes. So there's some cosmetic changes to the accounts. So look and feel has improved and also the actual content has reduced. So we've had an exercise for our external auditors following uh, recommendations that we've gone through the accounts and it's reduced by a third. As you're all aware, it's been a difficult year of COVID and the financial implications have are set out in the revenue outcome report and the capital outcome report that follows. However, there's a number of aspects that has impacted our accounts this year. Given the impact of COVID, our asset valuations have been um, impacted in terms of the decrease in value of our assets, as well as the pension valuations that obviously is based on the assets and liabilities on mortality rates, for example. The other aspect to think about is also the collection fund that takes all our council tax and NMDR. So given the large amount of reliefs that we have given this year, there has been a significant impact on our business rate position. Producing accounts this year has been difficult, obviously with, with the impact of COVID and also all the impacts on the finances. But obviously we're, we're here today with the set of accounts that the finance team have performed extremely well in order to get this over line so quickly. And also it spans just, not just within the finance team, but across the other departments as well. Um, a number of authorities we've spoken to would love to be in our position We've not only managed to have a draft set of accounts um, completed, but also we've actually we've signed off our 2019-20 in November last year. A number of authorities have still not signed off their 1819 accounts or their 1920 accounts, so we are in an extremely good position, and that's well done to the staff that managed to get us over the line. I'm not going to go through each aspect of the accounts or each note, however, I'll be open to questions on any part of the accounts. But before I pass it on to the members of the committee, just one final point to mention is that the public inspection notice will be published next week. That gives the opportunity for members of the public to inspect, object, and make formal questions to our external auditors. So I'll pass on to any questions that the committee has. Uh, thank you, Mark. Uh, this is a major project each year. Uh, it's been run exceptionally well by our, our team, who are clearly um, likely to meet all the, uh, the required target dates, uh, unless there's divine intervention. Um, so um, it, it's, um, it's, it's doing well, I think, is the, the way we, we, we should put it. Um, are there any questions from members of the committee? And given the amount of, uh, of scrutiny that's already been um, made into the accounts from the officer and senior management side, uh, it, it is improbable that we, with our lack of expertise in, uh, in the financial accounting standards, will, will find any errors. But uh, the matter is open to observation, or can we move on uh, and note the draft statement of accounts? 
May Chair. Councillor King. I, I think bear with me this once. I shan't do this every time, but given the amount of time I spent on the other side of the, the table, if you like, uh, I'd like to sort of just affirm your own remarks about the quality of work and how well we've been served. Uh, this was, as you say, covered in depth um, in March. Um, so we don't need to go back through this again. My, my ob only other observation and request of the team, and I'm sure we would, um, as a committee, feel the same, is that despite the tremendous performance during the year, for reasons I know we understand, the pressures of the pandemic, when you look at what supports the audit statement and the statement of accounts, which is a key target performance, very understandably, and expected, we have some which have gone from green to red. So I think it'd be right for us to acknowledge that in the months that lie ahead, we'll be wanting to see adjustments and or a response to that. But I want to join with you in, in my own good wishes to the team and thanks to them. Thank you, Chair. We, we have an opportunity to look at the, um, the, the details of some of the financial matters later on in the agenda, but this is uh, the extremely important issue of just approving uh, or noting the accounts so that they can now go out uh, to, uh, to public comment. Um, is it agreed that we note the accounts? Agreed. Thank you. We now move on to item eight, uh, the internal audit annual report for 2020-21, which you will find on page 133. Uh, Hayley McGrath, Corporate Governance Manager, uh, will be presenting this to us. Thank you, Chair, and hello, Committee. So the report sets out for you the year-end report on the internal audit. We have a responsibility as a local authority to make sure that we have a robust internal audit programme that evaluates the effectiveness of our risk management and our governance process processes, making sure that we take transparent and open decisions and that we adhere to auditing standards and guidance. So we actually have an external internal auditor. So I manage the contract and our external auditors, uh, sorry, our external internal auditors are tier. And they, it's the first year this year of the contract. So they started at a very difficult time. So on the 1st of April, they took over the contract and they actually haven't been into our office yet, which is unusual for auditors. But I have to say the relationship that they've been able to um, maintain with the staff and they've met a lot of people online and using Teams has been great. And actually the support they've had from the officers around the organization in providing information has really helped them to deliver the service. So the report that they provide is known as the Head of Internal Audit Report, and that gives an overall assessment of our control arrangements. And that is one of the supporting documents for the next item on your agenda, the annual governance statement. So they give us an overall assurance rating in terms of our systems of internal control based on the work they've undertaken during the year. So they had 25 audits, and out of those audits, 44% achieved a substantial assurance rating. Now that's the highest level that you can have, which is extremely good compared to last year, we had a 33% level for substantial assurance ratings. And the number of limited assurance ratings decreased to one. So that was 4% of the overall total, which is down from nine last year. And we only had three urgent recommendations um, compared to 21 last year. The programme for internal audit has changed slightly. So it has been directed towards our COVID response. So some of the audits that we had undertaken at the beginning of the year were looking at the initial decision-making processes that we undertook and the service delivery during COVID and how we've changed some of those services quite quickly and quite rapidly. And what we wanted to do is make sure that when we moved very swiftly from a traditional office-based service to remote working and those systems changed, for example, payment processes, that we still have the right systems of control in place. And I'm pleased to say the audits that have been highlighted for you or set out in the report demonstrate that actually the systems of control were very good. So it's whether the committee have any questions or if there's anything that you would like further explanation of. 
Um, thank you, Heli. Um, can I also add that over the course of the, um, the, the year, any priority one recommendation, um, an urgent recommendation under the, um, the new scheme of things uh, has been looked at in detail by the committee and we've asked for a, um, a, uh, a, a, an explanation of the facts, the circumstances and what has been done because that was uh, seen as crucial by the committee to understand any really serious issues um, which were being uh, raised uh, in the audit. Uh, no matter how many, how many times we read the report, um, it's always just before the, uh, the, the committee starts that we notice uh, an error. Uh, and on page um, 141, the table, I think, refers to 2019-20, um, when it should be a summary of the audit for uh, 2021. Um, so if that can be uh, altered at some stage. Um, Councillor Fox has raised a point on Leisure World. Councillor Fox, could you uh, um, address your questions, please? Uh, thank you very much, um, Chair. Yes, I um, um, had just asked for some uh, additional um, assurance around um, the, um, the, the one um, audit area that um, only um, received a limited assurance, and I understand that was for um, CCHL, is that correct? Yes, that's right. And with CCHL, we allocate a certain number of our auditing days for them to choose what areas they would like to have audited. As a very small company, they don't, they're not of the size to have their own internal audit program, so we give them an allowance from our days. Those reports reports are for their management to take on board and to consider and as they've been through the board at CCHL they're now reported to this committee for information. With the Leisure World audit it was actually identified by CCHL management that they wanted to review the arrangements around cash taking primarily at events because they'd realised there was a lot of cash transactions, they're very busy on the night and they weren't sure that their controls were adequate enough to be able to be classed as robust. We asked the auditors to go and review the systems during COVID, so there was no events going on, which was a great opportunity for them to take an in-depth look at some of the previous events, walk through the transactions, see how the cash had been collected and allocated, and make sure the systems were correct. What the audit found was actually more cash was banked than we'd actually said had come through the tills because of the nature of the event and the speed that they're taking money. I don't think all of it was properly recorded. And what we've done is put some very robust systems in place. And actually they've got new systems now with the tills and a lot of their transactions are cashless. So they're actually going to events where they're not taking cash anymore, which obviously makes this system much more robust than it was previously. But they took on board all the comments that were made by the auditors and they've made those improvements. And what I would say it was their request. It wasn't an issue that we found as being a problem. Can I say thank you very much and thank you for the additional information that you emailed to the committee members as, as well. That's very helpful. <laughs> Councillor Bentley. Uh, Chairman, thank you very much indeed. And can I just offer my congratulations uh, on an excellent piece of work. Any test of any local authorities' paperwork and documents is can they be picked up and understood by anyone? And this can be, and that is very important. Remembering we always do that. Um, I just my question is on page one for one as well as the chairman mentioned, but a very different point. Uh, taking the ranking of reasonable and understanding what that means, there's quite a few in there, I understand, but there's two that stand out for me. I just wondered if you could comment on. Uh, and reasonable means it's good, but there are potential risks. So I just wondered what we consider to be the risks around the risk management and what we consider to be the risks around HR and payroll, please. Um, I can talk to you obviously much more about the risk management side because I know the issues that were raised in that report and it wasn't to do with our risk management principles and processes. It was a little bit to do with the paperwork um, in terms of making sure that we had captured all of the risks and we'd allocated them to the right areas. Our actual process for risk management, and you've got a risk management report coming to you at the next meeting, was actually very well received. 
and it was to do with the risk registers and how we set out some of that information. So we are going through a review process and we're also going through some training programs. So one of the areas that they picked up on was we don't have a training matrix for risk management for all members and for staff. So we're looking at rolling out a training matrix and we are actually allocating some time for member development and you'll be having a risk management training session primarily focused at this committee for your responsibility for managing risk as well as the portfolio holder so to give you an understanding of what those responsibilities are and how the process works with regards to the um HR one, I don't know the details off the top of my head because I don't have the report here with me, but I can definitely find the recommendations that were made. There weren't anything key. When there is a reasonable assurance level, previously that would have been known as substantial as opposed to a full assurance. With those ones, what was likely to happen is you probably have a number of level three recommendations. So they will be minor ones around paperwork signing off. And it's also about the new arrangements with Braintree and making sure that we've got the right processes in place between the two organisations. But I can certainly email the committee with a bit more detail on that one if you'd like me to. Chair May, no, that's absolutely fine. I just want, you've answered the question superbly. I just think since it raised the question, we just need to make sure there's a note to it and you've done that. So thank you. Any other councillors? Councillor King. Uh, similarly, thank you uh, for the quality of the work as ever. Um, I would just be interested to the extent that you have your head around this, uh, Hayley, with similarly with uh, the issue of key financial controls. I think in the context of what we're doing, accepting your description of what reasonable means, uh, any extra light you could shed on that would be good to hear. Again, I don't have the key financial controls report to hand, but again, it would just be level three recommendations. There would definitely not be any level one high level recommendations, um, but I will find out some more details and let you know. Any other comments? Well, in that case, um, councillors, uh, we, um, we reviewed, so we go on to note uh, the internal um, audit activity for the period uh, April 2020 to 31st of March 21. Is that agreed? Thank you. We then move on to item nine. Uh, review of the governance framework and draft annual governance statement, which you'll find on page 143. And here we are dealing with a, a report that outlines the council's duty to produce an annual governance statement, um, the effectiveness of the council's internal uh, control systems, uh, which are part, uh, contributory part to the statement of, um, of, of accounts. Uh, relying on the council's compliance with the seven principles of good governance, um, good in the home, good in the council chamber, good in the, uh, the office as well. Uh, we look at the policy uh, 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 framework. Uh, we have to assure ourselves that that is in place. We review the components um, of the policy and the ethical framework on an individual basis during the course of the year as part of our, um, uh, our work program. Uh, but we are required today to, um, to give our view uh, on the effectiveness um, uh, of, of those, those measures. Um, so uh, this is to be presented again by uh, Hayley McGrath, Corporate Governance Manager. Thank you, Chair. I think you probably gave it a very good introduction in terms of what the annual governance statement is about. It is a self-assessment. It's a review looking back over the year to identify any issues or concerns that we might have in terms of how the organisation is governed. And as the Chair said, complying with the seven principles of good governance, which is fundamentally the, the role of the Governance and Audit Committee, ensuring that we comply with those. 
As part of the process of gathering information, I look at quite a few things. The chair has referenced the policies and they come to you around about October, November time. And there is a, a meeting that's taken over by the monitoring officer and he will present to you all of those policies that underpin those principles um, for review because we think it's good practice to look at those on an annual basis. With regards to the annual governance statement, and not only do I look at those policies, I also talk to senior management and other managers around the organization. And I think it's fair to say they're probably robust conversations that I have. I have the opportunity to have individual sessions with all members of senior management, including the chief executive, and ask some really difficult questions about how they think the organization has been governed during the year, and to highlight any issues or concerns that have been raised through the monitoring officer and myself during the course of the year. We also look at the head of internal audit report. Obviously, that's a, a big part of our assurance processes because if our head of internal audit report highlighted that we weren't achieving a, a good, robust system, then obviously there would be concerns for the governance statement. So we have to produce a statement and it's set out in a format that's specified by SIPFA, and that's attached for you, uh, Appendix 1. It's wordy, but it gives all the details that SIPFA require in terms of the areas that we've looked at, and our commitment to making sure that we have resilient um, controls in place. As part of the process, we also look at the relationship with our companies, um, Colchester Homes, the CCHL and the Amphora companies, and also Colchester Community Stadium Limited. We also look at our partnerships, so that's the Joint Museums Partnership and the North Essex Parking Partnership in terms of how they are managed and how they feed into our systems of control and the effect that we actually have on them as well. As a result of all of that, we highlight any areas where we feel that there could be concerns, not necessarily where issues have happened or things have gone wrong, but where we feel the systems of control could be improved. And they're not necessarily items that are picked up in audit reports. So um, quite often, if you have a, a high level audit report, we will pick up that issue because we monitor the governance statement going forward. But the items that we've identified this year are areas where senior management team and other managers have recognised that there are potential issues in terms of the robustness of the system, not necessarily because of anything that the council does, but because of outside influences. And we actually put those into the statement. So the statement includes a review of the items that were highlighted last year and gives a summary of how they've been managed and also sets out the two items that we consider are important issues for us to continue monitoring during 21-22. The first one is a really key item in terms of IT. So we have potential cyber attacks all the time, not just Coaches Borough Council, but every organization across the world is subject to these cyber attacks. And we have to make sure that we are robust enough to be able to defend the organization and the, the controls systems when those attacks happen. So, in terms of, we highlighted we did have um, an attack last year that caused us some issues. It was resolved and we were able to deal with it, but we've just recognized that we need to keep continually improving our responses to those issues. The other item that we've highlighted is partnerships. Now, the, the pandemic for us highlighted the need for those effective partnership arrangements. Our community partnerships were so critical in providing a response to our residents at a time of crisis. And actually what we recognize is we have a, a wide range of partnerships. We just want to formalize that slightly and just make sure that we have a robust referral process in terms of knowing who our partners are and the relationship that we have with them. So it's a bit of a review of our partnership arrangements and we'll be undertaking that during the year. So attached to Appendix 2 is an action plan highlighting those two items, and that will be reported back to you around about November time in terms of the actions that have been undertaken and how um, we've improved those systems. And what I'm asking for you to do tonight is to agree those items and agree the statement. And once you've agreed it, I can arrange for the leader of the council and the chief executive to sign the statement off. And as the chair says, that will support the statement of accounts. 
So it's whether you have any questions. Councillor King, an observation for me, which is just to uh, confirm, as I'm sure that we all will, that this is a cracking performance in a tough year. And so to come up with a robust sense of achievement uh, and effectiveness of governance is a real, uh, really significant. And we ought to underscore that. Um, but beyond that, I just wanted to say, Chair, that I really welcome, and um, we've discussed this in the past, the, fo the focus on those partnerships and on cybersecurity and look forward to the detail of that. Thank you. Councillor Bentley. Uh, thank you, Chairman. I, I wasn't going to speak, but actually Councillor King has just prompted me and I agree with everything he has said, by the way. Uh, and I'm just thinking, um, for our residents, if you talk about an annual governance statement, they might not particularly be excited by that. But in this report, there's some really important things that this council has done over the last 12 months and beyond, actually, as Councillor King has said. And I wondered in terms of communications, how we were telling the public this, because there is a great story in here that I think otherwise would just be passed by us and signed by the leader and the chief exec, and it's all done and we move on. And actually, on behalf of the residents, the council and its staff have done remarkable things. And I just wonder whether we should consider a comms plan to go with this, to explain to the public exactly what has taken place and remind them just the amount of work that's done and taken uh, and done by officers and actually politicians too actually in this but if you read the the the, the in in between the lines of this and actually the, the content itself there is a wonderful story and i would hate to just lose that in a, it's an annual government statement let's move on uh, yes chairman i was just going to say to councillor bentley thanks for the observation i think it's very helpful i'm more than happy to pick that up with Councillor Dundas as the leader with, with the portfolio for communications and see if we can do something on that. That's excellent. Any further contributions, colleagues? So in that case, the, um, the, the decisions uh, that we have to take here is to note the review of the Council's compliance with the seven principles of good governance. Um, the international framework, good governance in public sector, uh, including the review of effectiveness of the internal audit uh, arrangements. Uh, and of course, in doing so, we note the, um, the two specific items which Hayley has uh, drawn our attention to uh, of um, cyber security and partnership working. And the second point is to approve the annual governance statement uh, for 20, uh, 2021. Uh, is that your, uh, your wish that we agree to those. Thank you. We now move to item 10, uh, the financial regulations for the uh, next but one financial year, 2022-23, uh, where we move forward to page uh, 155. Uh, and here we are considering um, how we should update the financial regulations um, going forward from that particular year. Uh, Paul Cook, do we have Paul Cook online? Yeah. Excellent. Paul, um, can you guide us through the, uh, the salient features that need updating uh, in the financial regulations? Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, it's been quite a while since the financial regulations were comprehensively updated, uh, which we should really do every year as part of the budget process. So this time around, uh, we're putting forward some recommended changes in good time so that they can be approved in turn by the council well ahead of setting the budget for 22-23. Um, we we'll just highlight the main areas of change. Firstly, since 2017, uh, a lot of the post designations have changed and some of the things that used to be done in the council are now done by Amphora. So that's one main area. Um, the provisions on the external audit process have got pretty out of date because the audit commission was still around during the last edition. So all that's been brought up to date. And then I think the regulations didn't really correctly set out a budget process because we have an integrated budget approach 
based on our strategic objectives rather than individual portfolio holder budget proposals. Um, the revisions also take on board that um, yourselves, Governance and Audit Committee, will now be receiving monitoring reports on revenue, capital and treasury, rather than as a shared responsibility with the scrutiny panel, albeit the scrutiny panel will, of course, still be able to look into any aspect of those matters. And we've also took the opportunity to tidy up the process on capital, put more emphasis on a good business case for every capital project and how we manage the programme in year. Um, the last area of proposed change where I've had some comments is on budget transfers, um, where I was proposing to make quite a substantial increase in the level um, of decision making for portfolio holders, directors, etc., because it was a long time since the limits were changed. Um, I've done some more research and the vast majority of uh, budget transfers are actually what term technical transfers made by the head of finance, things like allocating pay awards or setting up a new cost center where we get external grant funding. An actual use of the environment facilities by portfolio holders and directors is very limited, very seldom. So if it would assuage some concerns about uh, allowing large-scale budget transfers without reference uh, to members, I'd be quite happy either to stay with the environment limits as set out in the 2017 edition, or perhaps just double them because of the passage of time. Um, but that's something you may wish to discuss. Um, so that is, in a nutshell, chairs uh, the proposed new financial regulations, which after amendments by yourselves would then be referred on to council uh, for approval. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. So um, the, the changes really are technical, semantic, uh, general tidying up. Um, but there is this question of, um, of control of budget varmints or transfers, as we, we now call them. Um, I did express concern about uh, making too, too large uh, changes uh, in this particular area of control. Uh, and uh, I hope that wasn't seen Paul, as an edict rather than just a, a question. Um, so I think we, we really need the sort of sense from the committee uh, whether uh, we should make a significant uh, increase in the uh, uh, in the level of environment, or given what uh, what Paul has said, um, just uh, updating for for inflation and sensible management need. Uh, anyway, comments, colleagues. Councillor Fox. Um, thank you very much, uh, Chair. Um, and thank you to, um, to Paul Cook for, for the report and that additional information around um, budget transfers. And actually that, um, that sense that um, these are usual technical adjustments um, done um, internally by officers provides me with a level of reassurance that um, uh, I don't think the committee needs um, uh, that much concern over the potential for, for, for budget transfers to be taking place without members' um, uh, knowledge or approval. Uh, what, what, what I'm quite interested in though is it clearly has been some time since these were, were reviewed and the, the process by which these would be reviewed on an annual basis. To, uh, and I suppose um, that's where I'd like some reassurance that um, there would be um, the opportunity for um, Governance and Audit Committee to uh, uh, to be part of that review on an annual basis if that's going to take place as part of um, budget setting in the future. Uh, and um, I suppose it, it's it's the importance that those are taking place um, transparently so that so that members are aware of them uh, rather than them being wrapped up in a in a budget process that then that 
that then gets lost and that, that there is then that lack of oversight over um, any changes that are made to the financial regula regulations um, if they are updated on, a, on an annual basis. And, and just some reassurance uh, around that, I think, would be helpful um, from my point of view. Thank you, Chair. Councillor Bentley. I think Councillor King may have indicated first, Chairman, but you, oh, well, that's very kind. Thank you. I, I will go very, very simply. Um, I'm more relaxed about the, the, the budget transfers, although I would have thought and expected and hoped uh, it's done in the full knowledge of the Cabinet Member for Resources, as long as that is done and noted, and I think that is probably okay from my point of view. Uh, but my question is very much on the lines of Councillor Fox, that if these haven't been done for a while, for whatever reason, um, they need to be done annually, that this should be a, uh, an annual part of, and a statutory part of this committee's meetings in future. And if it is, in as much as there are no changes proposed, fine, but I do think perhaps we should have it as a statutory item on our agenda. Councillor King. Thank you, Chair. Um, my point's been said by my colleagues, but you wanted a sense of the room. Um, we shouldn't have a concern about this in, in my judgment. Um, I'm assured by um, Mr. Cook that this is good practice. It looks like it, and it doesn't take, none of this takes away from, indeed, I think it adds to the effectiveness of work and the transparency of operation. Um, the description here of the changes proposed gives that affirmation. So I think we've got good open process and we're helping things happen, we should want that. Mm -hmm. But I'm absolutely with my colleagues in saying this should be overt once a year confirmation uh, that we're in the right place as well as when necessary suggestions of change. And I think we would ask the finance team to take away this, that explicitly, to have a statement once a year about where we stand against our counterparts because uh, it's not good to have so much catching up um, in one go but i'm up for this as described thank you does the leader of the council or the portfolio holder for resources have any views that they would like to express to the committee on this matter Paul, are you able to um, to respond to the question, respond to the comments by councillors? Um, thank you, Chair. Yes, I mean, I think it is unfortunate uh, the revision has been so long delayed. Um, obviously, we can plead the COVID pandemic, but I think it should have been done before, and I would certainly welcome uh, an annual review. I think this sort of stage of the um, municipal year is probably about the right time because then all the issues would be clear cut before we start the budget in earnest, rather mix the two together. So, you know, I'd really welcome that if we, if we sort of put this as an annual um, target to come forward with any changes. Um, I think that would be very strong. Thank you. So given, given that we have not actually updated the financial limits as set out on page 199 for, for some considerable time uh, and resolving that in future Chairman, we will do it on- you had on... an indication across the floor Sorry. a little while ago. Sorry, Councillor Nisson, I didn't, didn't see you. My humble apologies. Thank you, Chair, and thank you, Councillor Oxford. Um, as you asked for a sense of the, the room, um, I wanted to reiterate my support for um, Councillors Bentley, Fox and King in terms of the annual um, consideration by the Governance and Audit Committee for um, looking at those limits. And um, I'd also like to pass on my thanks to Paul for his excellent work on this as well. Thank you. Once again, my apologies. Um, would us, an acceptable way forward be to adopt the, um, the financial limits set out in the table on one, page 199, but resolve that in future it will be reviewed by this committee on an annual basis? I'd agree. So, uh, the, um, the, the decisions are to approve the financial regulations, um, subject to the amendment that we've just made and to recommend approval of the financial regulations as amended to council 
Is that agreed? Thank you. We then move forward um, to page 201, um, the finance monitoring report, uh, where the committee will consider a report setting out the financial performance of the general fund services and the housing revenue account uh, for the year 2020-21. Uh, and of course, this is our opportunity to ask any searching questions about um, uh, the, the details uh, in the expenditure uh, of the immediate past uh, financial year. Uh, Paul Cork, Head of Finance, is presenting, I believe. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, probably the best way into this report is to look at uh, Section 5.1, which is a summary of the general fund revenue outturn for the year. It's just to explain that although there were a lot of changes to income and expenditure during the year, uh, we didn't formally change the budget because it's quite important to maintain that as a baseline, particularly uh, when we're making claims to MHCLG. So there are some rather large swings which are set out in this um, section. So there was an overspend on the general fund of 7.972 million. Uh, predominantly, this was due to less income than assumed when we set the budget in areas such as car parking, sport and leisure um, and our commercial investment properties. Um, but then we had excellent support from the government. We had 8.9 million of government support. So that counteracted the income losses to all intents and purposes. And it also enabled us to cover some unforeseen costs such as redundancy costs, and some cost pressures that are set out in detail in the report. And then we also had some year end adjustments. So as you might expect, we had to make an increase in the bad debts provision. Um, we were also reviewed by external audit last year on our investment in M4 energy. And because that project is uh, delayed, um, we've made some minimum revenue provision on the advance that is part of our capital expenditure. And we've also increased our general fund minimum balance um, because we always maintain 10% of our net expenditure. So taking all those uh, large factors together, um, we had an overspend of 38,000, which I think is a very good result by services given all the um, difficulties of COVID and managing the situation and then um, the rest of the report and the appendices set out in some detail um, the slight overspend analyzed in various ways. And on housing revenue account, um, we can carry forward the underspending to next year to carry on with our capital program. So I think on balance, quite a good result in a difficult year. I um, would welcome any questions on the report, Chair. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. Comments from colleagues, questions? Councillor Bentley. Uh, well, just confirmation from Mr. Cook, if I may, really. And thank you for another excellently well written report, uh, as they all have been and are in, in, in this meeting. Um, I just want to clarify that the amount of money the government supplied. Uh, through grants actually cover the, the losses of all those services that we would otherwise expect income from. I just want to make sure, because it's in the paper, just make sure absolutely I've understood that, that the government did actually produce money to cover the, the, the losses we would have incurred through our commercial activities. Um, thank you, Chair. That, that, that is the case. I mean, it came in two different types of support. One was the income loss grant proper, which meets 75% of any income losses, but we also had general grants without any conditions. So taking the two together, we had more government support than we lost income. Thank you. 
Yes, but to, to be absolutely fair, we didn't actually make a profit of, uh, of one million pounds because we, uh, the, uh, the, the service budgets were 7.9 million over because of COVID. Government paid us 8.9 million pounds in grants, but there were other costs such as redundancies, uh, which, um, which also had to be covered. Um, so overall, it looks as though it just about balanced out um, but um, yes, there certainly was generosity on the part of government to ensure that uh, uh, that we didn't uh, even have to dig into reserves, as I understand it. Uh, although there was a lot of shifting money in and out of reserves, but at the end of the uh, financial year, we were broadly neutral. Um, so it was a, a, a well-managed year, uh, looking at Councillor King, of course. Uh, any further comments, any questions? This is your opportunity to delve into the, um, the finances for last year and identify anything which you don't understand or, uh, um, or, or about which you wish to make a point. Councillor King. Thank you, Chair. Thank, thank you, Paul and, and the team. Uh, an extraordinary year. Isn't it lovely that it kind of balanced out? I don't think any of us thought that as we were going through last year. Remember those scrutinies uh, Councillor Bentley, that we enjoy one after another. Um, it's good that we're in the position we're in now. And my question, Chair, is really about the future. Um, and I think that's relevant because although we're looking at the year just past, the trick is to take what lessons I'm sure the senior team have from that year forward. So could just ask a question, perhaps um, this might be for the Chief Operations Officer, um, about what we think in terms of income projection. Uh, uh, it would just be good to hear, given the whole last year, what we think we're seeing now and what the projections are. Thank you. Uh, yes, thanks, Councillor King. Uh, Paul might be able to give us some more precision on the figures, but I would say that uh, we have, for this year's budget, built in an expectation that income will not recover 100% to what it was pre-pandemic levels, for example, on car parking we're forecasting a reduction of income over the year of about one million and after two months of this financial year it's looking like we're not far off that figure um, i wouldn't want to give more detail than that because those numbers aren't um, audited yet but um, just to give you an idea uh, we're also expecting a reduced income from areas like sport and leisure largely because of the ongoing requirements for social distancing as well as reduction in memberships because people um, pulling away from the service during the pandemic. But of course, what we're trying to do is market those income earning services as far as we can to ensure that uh, income does recover quicker than we forecast. Uh, thank you for the explanation. Um, of course, this, the, the item we're considering is last year's uh, financial report, and uh, it's always easy to get out our crystal balls, as the Chief Operating Officer has just done so. Um, it's always useful to learn from the lessons, and uh, let me the, be the last to suggest we should not review last year to learn lessons for the future. Uh, but are there any other questions or comments on last year's accounts? Councillor Fox. Um, thank you very much, um, Chair. Just a, just a comment, really, on um, I think this report has been really well put, put together and gives a, you know, a really good overview of um, uh, just how well the Council managed um, last year. Um, but it was a year you know, of, of turbulence. And I think underneath those headline figures, um, it just demonstrates the um, impact on Council services and um, on uh, reduced revenue, increased costs, and uh, a number of projects that uh, have been set back. And certainly I look at that in terms of the, um, the housing revenue account, you know, which I was um, uh, obviously closely involved um, with over, over the year. And um, I think, you know, you, you can't look back without um, thinking about uh, the future as um, Councillor King um, has said, and um, certainly, uh, I think the the impact of the last year continues to be to be felt in the delivery of a number of um, projects, and particularly those big capital projects and that big capital expenditure, um, some of which uh, was inevitably um, delayed. 
Uh, and so, you know, I'll certainly be looking forward to future reports and how um, quickly and how soon um, those projects can get back on track because clearly they're really vital to um, uh, bouncing back from the uh, pandemic, whether that's, you know, car park income, um, the ability to um, reduce uh, social distancing and the impact that that might have on sport and leisure and uh, events uh, income for for the council, um, or some of those um, some of those uh, big projects uh, as well. I mean, I think what's remarkable is just seeing what what was achieved. You know, you look at the Northern Gateway project and the new um, sports park that was. Uh, and has been delivered, you know, which is r remarkable considering the uh, the impact of the pandemic, the um, the launch of the new Mercury Theatre uh, in the borough as well, um, and you know those are certainly uh, you know the the sorts of key projects that will be part of Colchester um, being um, revitalised as uh, as we go forward from the from the pandemic. Thank you, Chair. Uh, I think we were straying into the capital expenditure outturn, which is the next item on the agenda, uh, but I think we can carry forward all your uh, gracious remarks about the, the capital achievements uh, of the past. And of course, the housing revenue account, we, we tend to gloss over that and, uh, and look at the general fund, but the housing revenue account um, um, broke even, was well managed, and, um, uh, and continued on a good trajectory for our uh, our tenants and, and leaseholders. Uh, any further comments on the financial monitoring statement for the year end? In that case, um, we are asked to note the financial performance of the general fund services and the housing revenue account for the year 2020-21. Uh, Is that your agreement? Thank you. We now move on to um, the, the capital expenditure outturn uh, on page 225, uh, which is in the new format, uh, which the finance department hope will make it easier and clearer for us to track uh, the progress of the, the, capital, um, the capital projects, uh, which in the past has just been a little, little difficult trying to deal with A0 documents on the, uh, uh, on the desk and so much information that, um, that we went into overload on what was happening on the capital uh, projects. But they are now um, much clearer in terms of their presentation uh, for us to scrutinise. So we're back to Paul, Cock, Paul Cook, uh, Head of uh, Finance. Uh, any remarks, Paul? Um, no, just very briefly, Chair, um, the table under Section 5.1 uh, sets out what we actually spent in 2021, and obviously COVID had quite an impact because of uh, changes to construction methods. So um, I think that's a reasonable result in the circumstances. Obviously, it gives us a backlog to catch up, and we will be coming back to yourselves uh, with the first capital monitor for quarter one um, of 21-22 in the near future, where we'd hope to see the start of the catching up process. And then, as you say, Chair, we've got the appendix where we've got uh, RAG ratings on the schemes. Uh, the only one that's uh, scored red is Shrub and Depot, where I think we're taking um, a strategic look at that project to make sure that anything we actually do within the council is future-proof in terms of wider development. Um, so really happy to answer any questions and I don't know, perhaps Dan would like to come in on this report. Thank you. Chief Operating Officer. Uh no further comments, to be honest, Chairman, just to um, echo what Paul was saying uh, and the comments he's highlighted. Thank you. You've given us an excellent uh, exposition uh, of the highlights of the capital programme from last year. Uh, do any colleagues have questions on the overall uh, capital um, 
outturn or individual schemes within the, uh, the program listed. Councillor King. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, I, I would just like to, to ask for a little bit more information either here or away from here, Chair, about the Shrub Bend uh, Depot. I've been through the comments at the back. I think um, my question, Dan, would, would, would be knowing that this has been several years in the making and, and that there is a, an issue for, for us as councillors who care about the service and, and the tough conditions for the people who deliver it uh, would be that whatever the adjustments or the review, that there is a genuine commitment and a plan to carry forward change that will improve those conditions. And I know that that was taken personally by you, Dan. I think it'd be very helpful for us all to hear a bit more flavor about where we are, what we think is going to happen next, accepting what the words say, which there is a review. Thank you. I'm happy to give a, a bit more flavor, Councillor King. Uh, the, uh, the proposals for Shrub End Depot uh, were um, certainly uh, quite far progressed pre-pandemic uh, about 18 months ago and obviously significant operational changes and pressures have led to that work being delayed. Uh, it's true to say that the operating processes we have at the Shrub End Depot have changed fundamentally actually as a result of the pandemic. For example, the fact we have separate crewing out areas now, whereas uh, we used to have one uh, single mess room where all of the staff would gather together every morning. Clearly that is not uh, something that we would encourage these days in the, with COVID security. So that's important. Uh, we have um, a number of proposed uh, uh, changes that we would like to make, we need to make for operational reasons that are quite urgent for compliance and for welfare of uh, staff um, working on the site. So there are some changes which, is, uh, which will be being made this financial year, but we're also conscious that the site has the potential for a more strategic review of the operation to ensure that it's uh, working seamlessly with and alongside the County Council's operations uh, adjacent to our depot. So that's part of the longer term view. Uh, uh, but the immediate works will be going ahead now. Is that, is that acceptable, Councillor King? Uh, Dan, I think I would, one focus for me right now would be about the quality of the working conditions. Could you offer, because that was not to scratch in your, my and other views, accepting what you've just said about strategic change, do you completely get that? Uh, what's your take on the quality of the working conditions um, for the, those staff on that site? Uh, I think the quality of the working conditions could always be improved. I would say we have invested uh, a lot of time and effort to make, sh make the best of the facilities we've got. Uh, we have much better engagement with staff so that we can understand their issues and concerns directly and listen to those and feed those up through the management layers so that we uh, adopt any changes that need to be made. But I think that the new way in which we crew out is much better. It's a much more effective operation. Uh, so it's an unexpected benefit of uh, having to make changes because of the COVID crisis. Uh, we have made uh, other modest improvements to some of the facilities and the space that our uh, staff work in uh, and the outside space, the bike sheds and things like that. So there, there are some changes we've made. We're, we're absolutely conscious that um, the building uh, and the yard could be better, and we want to make those improvements, and I know the portfolio holder does too. Uh, thank you. Councillor Bentley. Uh, thank you, uh, Chair. I, uh, I know we're encouraged not to do this, but given the fact there's an intrinsic link with the County Council, I think I should just declare my obvious interest in that. And my question is on the same subject uh, and very similar to uh, Councillor King, and thank you, Mr Gascoigne, for the update. I just wondered whether, though, given the fact we are the Governance and Audit Committee, we should commission a further report and update on this to come back to us, given it is rag raid for all the reasons we understand, but I just think actually we ought to be asking for uh, a comprehensive update and maybe on a regular basis uh, to make sure that this is delivered and not just left at red next year, maybe. Mm -hmm. 
we would have the options of either asking for a specific report now or asking that the item come back as a, as a, a, a line item on a future work program. Uh, do you have any preferences? So, so for me, I think it's, it's to do the future work program, which is coming out, but I think it's actually a report specifically rather than just a line item. So we will note um, a, a report to the committee uh, just uh, encapsulating the, um, the sentiments of what we've heard, plus anything uh, additional which is relevant to our um, scrutiny of the, uh, the capital programme. I, I would welcome that, Chair. I think this has been a long time in the coming, and, and we completely get why it's not been resolved. Um, but this has been years of conversation. When I first joined, I was first joined the Cabinet for my three years. This was a conversation at the beginning of those three years, so three years ago. So we, we need to know what's going to happen, when it's going to happen, what's going to be spent, what the outcomes are going to be. Uh, and I think that's a legitimate request, and that allows space for the strategic work and review that's been talked about. So I would welcome that. Can I ask whether the leader of the council or the portfolio holder for resources has any comments on this matter? Evening, thank you. I'll just be very, very brief. Um, I, I think I'd echo uh, what, what's been said, really. Um, there's certainly f full commitment on, on our behalf to uh, expedite the project. Um, you know, I think we, we discussed it last year, actually, at, the, at this committee, I think, probably at this juncture, um, and when we were looking at the same uh, agenda item um, online, though, then. Um, and I think, yes, it, it hasn't got much further. Um, and uh, we'll certainly be keeping the pressure up to uh, see it delivered. I think, as Councillor King correctly says, uh, I think we were both elected at the same time, and I think it was sort of high up the agenda then, and we are still pretty much at the same stage. So um, should this committee wish to make it an agenda item, I'm sure the portfolio holder will attend, and uh, you can give it the attention it deserves. Thank you. Thank you, Leader. Are there any other comments from members of the committee? Councillor Fox. Um, thank you very much, um, Chair. And I would echo that I know the goalposts have moved over the years, but I think since I joined the Council as well, this, um, um, the Shrub End Depot has been a, a project requiring um, some work um, too. Um, I will um, try not to wax lyrical about the capital programme chair, um, but it is worth noting that Colchester Borough Council, in terms of its size as a district and borough council, is investing a significant amount of money in, in capital projects compared to other authorities um, in, the, in the country. And I think regardless of the administration, that is a, uh, that is a good thing. Um, I just wanted to ask around the local full fibre network broadband item um, and note that the, the challenges around um, work permits um, with highways. Um, the, on page 227, it says that the entire assigned budget um, for that section will have been spent by the 30th of June um, of this year, which we're not far off. And I just wondered if we could uh, have any update on whether that has happened or will happen by next week. Do we? Um, so, this is an operating issue or a finance issue. I, I, I <clears throat> sorry, I, I can get back to Councillor Fox and the committee with a, a report on that. The last I heard was probably about two weeks ago and it was on track. So happy to provide an update. Thank you. Any other comments? Portfolio holder for resources. Uh, thank you, Councillor Woods. I just wanted to give some reassurance to the committee on the, the shop end site. Obviously, it's in my ward, it's in my division as well. Um, and the first question that I always ask is, what are the operatives saying? You know, what do they need? What are their wants? Um, so please be assured that we are, are looking at their immediate needs um, to ensure the site runs as efficiently as possible what I certainly don't want to do is to put money onto the, into the site, which then is not needed in a very, very short period of time. 
So uh, please be assured that we are looking uh, at what the operatives need uh, at this exact moment. The committee looks forward with expectation to this report on Shrub End. Thank you for your contribution. Any further questions from colleagues? In that case, can we move to agreeing the, um, the decision? Um, two parts here. An additional part, we have asked for a report on Shrub End, which uh, uh, will be delivered. And the second uh, part of the decision, uh, we've reviewed the progress of the capital programme uh, as set out in the report of the associated spending for the financial year and the budget forecast for future years. Uh, and we re reviewed the, uh, the RAG rating of each scheme uh, as rated by the relevant project manager. Uh, is that decision agreed? Thank you. And that takes us to the all important last item on the agenda, the work programme for this um, civic year, uh, which is set out on page 237. Uh, and um, Matthew Evans, Democratic Services Officer, will be outlining the, uh, the issues facing us. Um, thank you, Chair. The purpose of this report, members, is simply to make you aware of the proposed work programme for the forthcoming municipal year. And um, it's your opportunity to comment um, or make any suggestions that you might wish to, or simply note the comments. Um, we're really determined to, we'll add in an additional item um, on the Shrub End Depot project. Um, I think that's possibly something, the timing of which would have to be agreed with officers outside the meeting. Um, but that's, that's it for this report. If you have any comments or questions to know. Yes, well, mo most of the items on our, our work programme, which is on page 238 and, uh, and following, uh, are what I call the natural rhythm of the council. Things happen, uh, we have to review, we do things, and council uh, uh, takes on our recommendations. So it's um, the, 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 the items which come along are sort of fixed in the sand by, uh, uh, by external forces, uh, and we... We just have to get through that work programme. But it's essential that we add to the work programme any relevant issues which, uh, uh, which councillors feel we should be looking at uh, as the Governance and Audit Committee. We've already heard um, suggestions, requests um, uh, this evening that we should have further training on cyber security, which is a, a very topical matter and we've all we all understand uh, just how quickly things and how disastrously things can go wrong uh, in other organizations. And it's essential that we, uh, uh, we keep that um, well under control. And part of that process is ensuring that members of the governance committee uh, and other members of the council, of course, understand what is necessary uh, for us to take a seasoned view uh, on whether what we're doing within the council is sufficient to protect um, our information, our operations and the, uh, the assets uh, of the council. Uh, and the second point that was mentioned was that we need um, some training on risk analysis, uh, which uh, is quite a difficult subject to apply um, to, um, to the council's operations. It's probably easier to, uh, to apply it to industrial processes, but we have to, um, uh, we have, to have a, uh, an assured risk analysis program uh, for the overall operations of the, uh, of the council. And again, it's important that we understand those issues. So um, uh, are there proposals about how we're going to deal with it, these two items? Will they be uh, additional items on the agenda or will they be part of the training program? Um, are there any views on this? Um, Hayley, it's, uh, it's your bailiwick. Thank you, Chair. With regards to risk management, what we're proposing to do is add a, an item on the member development program in the formal training schedule, and it'll be open to all members, members, but primarily directed to members of the Governance and Audit Committee, an overview of risk management at Colchester.
an understanding of our processes, an understanding of how we draw that information together, the role of senior management team, but also an understanding of the responsibilities of this committee. So that will definitely be a members training program item. With regards to cybersecurity, I would probably suggest a, a members development program um, item as well, but that will be for the committee to decide whether you'd rather have a report to this committee or a, a more in-depth training session. Councillor Bentley. Uh, well, I was actually going to suggest exactly what we've just heard. Uh, I agree with that completely. Uh, my view is any training should not be part of a committee meeting because you need to look at something and deal with it in a very different way and you're learning so you're not uh, you're not uh, scrutinizing you're learning so I think from my point of view they should be separate member training sessions. My, my other comment on this just looking at and it could well be that it's done this way because reports will have to be uh, programmed in a certain way but looking at the 19th of October which looks quite light compared to the 23rd of November, which looks like an all-nighter to me. I'm wondering whether we can move some of those reports round so it evens out a little bit. There is a degree of natural attrition with items on the agenda. Sometimes they're there, sometimes they're not there. Um, so, but I think we, we take on board your very sensible statement uh, or suggestion, uh, Councillor Bentley. Uh, Hayley. Yeah, can I just clarify the November meeting? There's a lot of items on there, and that's what's known as the monitoring officers session. So they're all the policies and procedures that form our governance frameworks and our ethical governance policy. Um, they don't tend to take too long. What we do is do a quick overview for you, run through the policies and procedures and make sure you're happy with them. They're just the, the annual review, but they all form part of that framework so it's appropriate that they're brought together as i say the monitoring officer tends to take over that session and we run through them quite quickly so we like to keep them together um, it does make that agenda a little bit look a little bit heavy but actually it does make sense on the night uh, i probably understand that so i'm thinking keep that there but things like the treasury management report uh, and the capital monitoring reports, could that not be moved? So then you just have one evening just with the monitoring officer then? We found in previous years is to do with the timings of the statements of account and the audits that are undertaken by the external auditors. They're not able to produce them sooner to take them to the earlier meeting because it would make more sense to take them to the October one. But because of the, the formal timings of external audit, they go to the November meeting and they have to be scheduled on that one because we have to publish them by a certain time. So I think we're back to the natural rhythms. You know, the, the, the audit work has to be done at a, a particular time. Councillor Fox. Thank you, Chair. Um, I welcome the opportunity for some additional um, training for the committee. I think that's um, a good idea. Um, if um, Councillor Bentley is looking for more items to add to the October meeting, can I suggest that we do actually ask for a report um, on uh, cyber security to be brought to the committee because I think um, it is an increasing area of risk for um, um, the public sector in general um, and, and uh, as a result um, this authority um, as part of that uh, and I think it would um, benefit us having that information um, in the public domain to reassure our residents that the authority is taking um, the issue seriously and, and so that we as a committee um, can really look in depth at how um, uh, to reassure ourselves um, also that um, we've, we've got everything in place um, to, uh, uh, to, to secure the authority um, in, that, in that domain. I, I do think that this is going to be an increasing area of, um, of risk as well um, for us. Uh, and I think it's right that we that we do um, ask for a report and to be provided to us uh, in public. Um, so cybersecurity and risk analysis are both going to come up, I guess, um, uh, as part of other items on the agenda. Uh, risk analysis, certainly. Um, cybersecurity, um, a, a very sensible proposal that this is a, a, an ever-increasing threat to all organizations 
institutions, and uh, we should understand uh, just what it means uh, to the council. Um, that will be delivered then in the form of um, training programme and also uh, a committee report. I do have just uh, a, a tinge of worry about uh, a report on cyber security uh, in this council on the public domain. If it's really bland and doesn't really, you know, it just gives us a warm feeling, um, that's fine. If it's going to go into any detail about how we secure the systems and what is done, then I think we would need a conversation with the chief operating officer about whether that should be taken in part B of the uh, um, of, of the report. Uh, I, I understand Councillor Fox's desire that it should be done in public so that there is reassurance from the uh, residents of the borough that we are properly managing their data and their information. Uh, but I can see dangers and I think we need to, to consider offline just how that issue should be dealt with. But I sense it is the wish of the meeting um, that we include a, a, an additional item on cyber security uh, on the agenda. Councillor Bentley was first, uh, then Councillor Oxford, then Councillor King. Uh, uh, Chairman, I would absolutely agree with you on that, although one would hope no report is ever bland that comes to this committee or any committee come to that, but I take the point, perhaps it should be in part B. I thought we were being offered training in cyber security. That's why I made the point it should be a training session. If we're talking about a report and training, Okay, I accept what you just said and what Councillor Fox said, but I thought the substantive point was on training, unless I've missed it, which I think ought to be separate and we should be trained separately. Councillor Oxford. Thank you, Chairman. I was pretty much what uh, Councillor Bentley just said. I think we should have the training first and the, any report that comes should be on the yellow um, because obviously we need to... We don't need to tip our hand um, uh, to the um, very able people who um, are scamming people left, right and centre, etc. So I think if we train every, everybody first, then, then they might have the information on which to ask more searching questions when uh, the report comes on yellow. Are there any other questions from members before we have a response to that? Hayley. Thank you, Chair. I think you're quite right. What we will do is have the training session programmed in hopefully in the next couple of months so we can give you an overview of your responsibilities for cybersecurity and how we do it at Colchester and then bring a more general report to you later on in the year to the October meeting and also looking at how we compare to other organisations that are similar to us what standard practice out there at the moment, what's good practice and how we compare to that. I think that's a conversation in terms of actually what we do and how we do it. Um, we would need to consider whether that is something that's appropriate even on a part B item. But obviously it's a conversation that we can have with you at the training session and take a view on how much detail you'd like us to go into for the report. Chief Operating Officer, are you happy with, uh, with that approach? I think it's an excellent suggestion, Chairman. Yep, so I think the training session, we can program it on the work program for October and at the training session agree uh, how we want to handle that at the October meeting to ensure it doesn't compromise the Council's security. Are there any other observations or comments on our, our work program for the rest of the civic year? Can we agree the work programme with the amendments that we have just discussed? So, thank you. And that brings us to the end of today's um, agenda. Uh, can I thank you for your attendance and hope you have a safe